Hello, I'm Dr. William Schlosser, Washington State University School of the Environment. This is my classroom. What I'm going to tell you now is we talk, start to talk about the changes in species. This came from Kamiak Butte. Uh, I went up uh, with Aiden Elmel and Mason Minerin uh, to Kamiak Butte yesterday, and we pulled these uh, images off the cameras. This is on the south-facing aspect, and what I want you to notice right now is a mule deer. As I see that deer walking across the screen, what I want you to pay attention to is how do I tell the difference between a whitetail and a mule deer? Right there, you see that white patch on the rump with a little black tail tip. That black tail tip, it tells me right away, hey, that's a mule deer. Now, a lot of folks will say, no, no, you got to look at the ears. That's where all the difference is. It's in the ears. They're big ears. Well, my challenge to you is to say, is that a bigger ear than a white-tailed deer if I'm not standing a white-tailed deer right next to it right now? Well, obviously, I can't. Think about how these species uh, have evolved. In this case, it is the mule deer living on Kamiak Butte, uh, knowing that, hey, we're only 10 miles away from Pullman. I don't have any mule deer in Pullman City, but I got a lot of white-tailed deer. That is the animals responding to the restrictive environments. In this case, the, the mule deer, you, you can see them out here. It's a herd of about uh, 15 deer. Uh, a bunch of them are hiding in the brush in there. I've got some different videos that pull them out. But what are they doing right now? This uh, was recorded two days ago. These deer were out there milling around. There's also uh, this got a bull moose and a cow uh, walking right on the same Kamiak Butte area. They're in there having a good time. They're just living it up. This is their restrictive environment as well. And everybody, we think about the moose. A lot of us at least think about Alaska. We got the big moose up there. Golly, they're about seven, eight feet at the shoulders, monstrous things. That isn't the moose that we have here. The moose that we have here is a, a variety called Sarasi moose, as opposed to what we have up in the Yukon uh, in Eastern uh, United States, different varieties of the same species. That variation that gave rise to these different species has come through this idea of genetic mutations. They landed in the life of these animals. And when they landed here, some of the beneficial things became passed on to the offspring. And you know, there's three kinds of uh, genetic mutations we see, one being a negative mutation, one being a positive, and then being neutral, the three things. When it becomes a positive attribute and it's passed on to the offspring and it gives them an advantage, then you've struck a, the deal right there to say we have that genetic code, it was changed and it became beneficial and so it's passed on. And what I'm gonna do throughout this entire uh, lecture this morning then is to talk about how this all brings up the understanding that we have, the ec ecological adaptations. I keep talking about that restrictive environment, the things that the animals and plants, it's not just animals, but the plants like you see here, they fit into that niche. The idea that they can have that change that gives them the advantage to thrive and survive always between the members of the same species and between adjacent species, those co-mingling types. Now, obviously right here, I have a, a ponderosa pine on the left-hand screen and a sagadro cactus on the right. Okay, obviously they're not in the same environment, but they both responded to the restrictive environments where they exist. And that becomes an ecological adaptation. You've seen it in terms of evolution and how those mutations happen. I'm gonna really key it into this idea of adaptive evolution this adaptation side, right? This is where I'm trying to bring out the idea that these adaptations have an advantage or a disadvantage. You can see it, if there's a disadvantage, that means that species is less competitive in its environment where it lives. They're taken out of the gene pool pretty fast then. They aren't passing on their genetic materials to their offspring. And a lot of times they just don't have them. For some species, that means they got eight uh, really fast. They didn't make it even to maturity. Uh, sometimes it just means they make it to maturity, but still they, they aren't really developing those skills and those techniques to pass it on, to be successful in their, their mating. That is the passing of their genetic materials and the adaptations that they brought. Mechanisms of evolution. I want you to think about that. It's the idea of gene flow that I'm going to pass on my genes to my offspring. That's the only way I can pass it along, really. But there's also an idea of genetic drift. That idea that the genetic mutations that changes within a species, it'll make a little bit of a change. And we're going to talk next week about a thing called metapopulations, where we have that population like we started out this morning with a mule deer on Kamiak Butte. And that's a little bit isolated. I wouldn't say it's totally isolated. 
And we'll loop back into that with the idea of these metapopulations and how they interact, how they share their genes. But think about this one where that's a, a smaller population that doesn't have a lot of flow uh, to those from those source areas to the sinks that we see like a Kamiak Butte. There'll be a genetic drift, a genetic selection for those mule deer at Kamiak Butte that makes them more successful step by step. We could always go through that, uh, the filter of genetic selection. The idea that the most successful are going to have more offspring, they're going to spread their gene flow quite a bit further or longer, and that becomes the, the mechanism to enact all of these things through gene flow and genetic drift. Natural selection is really how it comes to life. That natural selection can be the idea of a predator taking prey. The prey that are not as fast, spending their time where they aren't benefiting themselves, that's natural selection too. The predator can take them out. You start to change the things in the environment. You see how we affect as humans, uh, just with the thing, like I've said a number of times, we'll tie back on it and more and more, is the idea of removing the wolf. We expatriated the wolves from uh, continental United States, killed them all. Now we, we start to see the effects are how the prey respond. We see it right here at Kamiak Butte, where you have the mule deer uh, parsing together in groups of 20 and 30. The, you see the white-tailed deer in the same site, interacting side by side with those mule deer. Their behavior is very specific to not having a top-level predator there. We do have cougars, not so many, uh, but we do have cougars in that area, and they can feed on the deer and the elk and the moose. Their take is not the same as a wolf pack would be. And the coyotes, hey, they're just really not gamed up to take out the bigger ungulates, even the deer. Yeah, they'll make clinic out of a mouse or a rabbit. Just isn't the same thing as the deer and the elk and the moose. That is the process of natural selection. You know, to think about this in a simplistic way, that little lizard feeding on the bugs, it's because the bugs stand out, right? They're brown on a green background. The natural selection just says, yeah, I'm going to take it down based on this and that. The way these heritable traits are developed and how they're passed along, action of being a genetically selective item. It has to be that process of heritable traits. You see it in the genome and you can follow that and track it out. This is a part of that natural selection process. You're standing out, but if you're that bug who's brown, you just have a great deal of natural selection now because you're going to be taken out of the gene pool just like that. I hope you've seen by now that everything we see in the abiotic land is a process of change. Change is the only consistent thing we have. We can count all that. It's not going to be the same today as it will be in 100 years, nor is it the same today as it was 100 years ago. And that's not just anthropogenic changes. That's not just because us humans got involved. Now, sometimes when we get involved, those changes are monumental. They're huge. And like taking out the wolf. That made a huge difference in how all of the prey species interacted, how they interfaced. What happened to the environment at that time? Well, we're going to touch on a lot of examples of that. Some of them very striking. Some you may say, yeah, I've seen that before. Others just say, wow, that explains a lot. Because this whole idea of the environment changing or being constant is going to really track it through for how you can understand and really filter all these ideas together. Put them together and see what I said from well, week number one. Ecology is about the study of interactions, that interrelatedness of every activity that happens in the environment. Interactivity, it can happen with the animals, it can happen with the plants, it can happen with the abiotic lands. Okay, well, you got to be saying, well, hold on, Dr. Bill, you can't be telling me that the abiotic lands, the geolo geology of the background, is going to have a reaction to what the animals do. And instead, that's exactly what I'm telling you, that the abiotic lands will have realization of what happens there based on what the animals do on that land. Now, we see it at Kamiak Butte as that first video I showed you with the mule deer walking over to the Saskatoon service berry. They went right to the plants and their heads are up and they're feeding them hard. They are out in that environment where the wolf used to be able to come in and, and feed on them. The wolf's purpose at Kamiak Butte, they were interacting there, just they weren't big packs living just on the butte. Just to say that's a metapopulation discussion, we'll have that one next week. But I do want you to think about those mule deer walking through the open fields, getting to the Saskatoon Silversberry and feeding on them hard. And the white-tailed deer do it too. That's where the, the moms are, are teaching the fawns how to get in there and do the same. That is their reaction to the environment. Why is it different now? Well, because they don't have their top-level predator forcing down on them, pushing them around and moving them out into their smaller herds and into the areas where they aren't going to have that same kind of impact. But I want you to be understanding that idea that all the environments we see 
don't think for a minute that any environment is stable and consistent to be exactly like this forever. We talked about that one with the climates of the last 500 million years. That whole push has seen that the climate uh, temperatures have gone up, they've gone down. We've been, been in ice ages and we've been in these hot uh, sauna time kind of environments as well. Uh, hey, we just came out of the last ice age period, but really we're not out of it yet. We've started to leave it because you go up north here quite a ways, you get up to the Yukon Territory, there's a lot of glaciers left there. We still have them in Alaska. And that is because that ice age is still retreating from here. Yeah, it's warming up. Uh, we expect that. We've been watching that go on for the last 500 million years. We have some really great data to say, yeah, we, we see it. And we're in the warming trend now. The bigger question, I know this one is uh, something I want you to track on to say, yeah, anthropogenic influences, hey, we're making that warm up in a different way than we would have anticipated. Sometimes much, much faster. Sometimes with the other things of these greenhouse gases. Now we have a change to the atmosphere that we haven't seen before. That is the amplification of the naturally expected climate change versus this anthropogenic influence. Hey, let's take this right back to Kamniak Butte. Hey, I get up there and I see on the right-hand side is my north-facing aspect and the, the left-hand side is the south-facing. All of this variation that we see across that landscape right now is being the restrictive environment. What I can say a lot about Kamiak Butte, that geologic substrate that says, I don't have the basalt flow right below me, like I have out on the, out of the edges of this shawl. That's the basalt floods, where the basalt floods landed, flowing down the water infiltration. But on Kamiak Butte, it's not. There is no basalt flows sitting up on the butte. It's all around the shawl. So when that water hits at the right temperature, right above zero, then it starts to melt. And it gets into that quartzite substrate, and it has a fast flow through. These plants are all responding to that environment. It is a big feature of that south-facing aspect, having its angle to the sun. We've talked about that one too when we hit on the climate, to know that that direct beating down sun is going to heat up those lands. It's going to really drive it out. Those plants are in that restrictive environment. Am I going to say that the ponderosa pine on the south aspect of Kamenic Butte are different from the north? I say no. They're the exact same species. The plants themselves, they have their own restrictions. They are the same ponderosa pine on the south-facing aspect. There is the environment dictating how they can resolve their health, their vitality, their vigor. To be everything of a big tree, a, a large diameter and taller. Why is tall important? Tall is important because the plant wants to be the first one to get that sunlight when it hits. They got to get up there and be taller than their competitors. You see that on the north-facing aspect. We saw it on the tree count data that we did from field trip event. Uh, we're getting the number of trees per acre of every species, north-facing and south-facing. That is the competition between individuals on that side. You can take that discussion of uh, competition between individuals and take it out to that grizzly bear, getting out of that river and saying, I've got one purpose in life right now, and that is to get fattened up for the winter. That grizzly bear in Alaska, hey, it's, it's going to go into the hibernation soon. So the first thing that it has to do is load up on that protein that comes from the salmon. It's eating the livers, the guts, everything inside that fish to build up that reserve inside of its body. But then it goes to sleep. Okay, that is its life cycle. Now, when it hits the river, it's in total competition for that one purpose in life. It's out there to get a meal. And you take a look at the right-hand side, and you can see that birch tree, right? And you see that big old black moth. You got to think, boy, that, that moth has uh, just not got the right genetic materials. It's black on white. And does everybody see the white moth right beside it? Okay, that white moth has got a great genetic selection criteria right there. It's an adaptation has found that through mutations, the same species has evolved. It's changed. It's not just a decision on that uh, insect's life. It is a process of reproduction that has the variations. You saw it in the, the Rock Pocket Mouse video. That random mutation has happened. It, it may be like one in a thousand. No, one in a million. It doesn't matter. When there's an advantage that has been struck, like that white moth on the right-hand side, it's going to have success. It's going to be able to live into its reproductive uh, life and pass on that genetic material to the offspring. Okay, all this idea of the things necessary for natural selection to hit from the genetic mutations that happened at random is that that mutation creates a heritable trait. You can have mutations that maybe are not heritable. The heritability brings out a very important idea to say that that genetic mutation, yeah, it changed something in my genome, but I've got to be able to pass that along to my offspring. 
When you can do that, then you've hit that first condition. But that favorable heritable trait, it has to be something that can be passed on to through a regular uh, breeding session. Okay, that is uh, going from mom to dad. And that I talked about that a couple of times, the re recessive trait versus a dominant trait. If that heritable mutation can be passed along, you have the mutation in one of the parents, mates with a parent who doesn't have that mutation, and that that mutation would be able to pass on to the offspring. But you start talking about that moth or that bear, or how about the deer and the elk? Yeah, they're having lots of babies, sometimes many a year every year, not just once every uh, five or 10 years, like some of us humans do, that mutation that meets up with its mate that can be passed along to the offspring. If they're having oh, something around, let's take the deer, maybe two babies a year, uh, that now you've got a little higher rate because you're going to have babies year and year after year. But the uh, reading lifespan of a deer or elk is maybe about uh, five to 10 years. Think about things like the moth, right? The black moth and the white moth. How many offspring did they have every year? Okay, you're talking thousands every single year, uh, sometimes twice a year. When I talked about the great horned owl. I was with Mason Metterin yesterday up at Kamiak Butte, and he was saying the, the great horned owl, we have a lot of them in this area. Right here in Poland, we got some as well. They may have two clutches every year. They get some, the environment's doing really well. They may hit it up for twice, having two clutches of babies and raising them up and going on. So now your ability to pass on that heritable trait has come up with a higher uh, amount of success potential. That is the restrictive ecological environment being the place where they can be re revealed. Okay, where the offspring have that advantage and it benefits them, and then they're thriving in that environment. And they can pass that along. We're going to call that the competitive event environment. The idea that the offspring of different uh, mates or different uh, partners all across that uh, little microsite environment, or macrosite, let's call it, uh, that they are going to be in competition for the resources of the lands. That competition is where your heritability and these traits of advantage come to play. That is your natural selection idea. You can talk about it in cacti uh, in the previous lectures, and I talked convergent evolution. In some of those cases, it's because that convergency selection that was made on those restrictive environments has given benefit. It happened for the cacti of different forms that were not related, but they had the same random mutations that happened. And the benefits were because of that, they were all in the same environment. Therefore, the same type of adaptations evolved. Now we see it all across that uh, entire ecosystem area to say, yeah, that thorny spine, that waxy thick plant cover, they all are serving the same end results, but they do not all use the same materials to get that mutation formed. It was random. It didn't get copied from one plant to the other, right? And here we have on the left, a whole bunch of different species. Hey, let's go to the right-hand side though. This is a different form completely. That is uh, asexual reproduction. This is the, the aspen tree. That little grove right there, it's all one individual. They clone through these rhizomes that sprout up new tops, but literally they are one plant. That is all related, not just related, it is one. It's like you putting up four or five arms. Okay, here they got different bodies, but that is a response to the restrictive environment met through uh, this adaptation. In this case, the rhizomes, its ability to reproduce itself without spreading out. We're going to touch on this one a lot more in the weeks to come, but I want you to really think about this idea of the reproductive isolation. You're going to have the variations that you see all across the landscape. We've talked a lot about this idea of adaptation through the rock pocket mouse. The abiotic that basalt flood that hit on the left-hand side of that upper screen, yeah, it's black now. And that br uh, light brown mouse who blended perfectly into the grasses on the right, it, it gets picked up by the predators who are visual in nature. It's that owl, it's a hawk, it's a coyote. What are the features that attract the predators to tell them where there is a meal? That is the restrictive environment. If you're the black mouse on the brown grasses, you're not doing too good. Hey, stay back home. You want to segregate yourself to stay where you thrive. That's totally what we're seeing in this whole evolutionary process here. I also want to feed it back around to one of the scenes from that video. You see this, it's kind of a, a sickly thing, right? That you got a lab where you have a bunch of dead mice in a drawer you got to pull out and inspect. Yeah, I can imagine you keep the cooling running really well in that lab. I don't want to go in when it's hot. But anyway, what I wanted to say is what they saw and they talked about in the video 
is that they went to a variety of different places in Arizona where the rock pocket mouse was found, where they had the brown mouse on the grasses, the floods came in, and then they had the black substrate materials they had to live on. So they trapped the mice. I know they did live trapping there, but then I see they had the, the bodies all, all held here into perpetuity. Okay, it's, there's some dead trapping going on. When they did the genetic analyses of these black mice, they wanted to see, do they all share this exact same mutation? In other words, was that one little population, a subpopulation that then spread across the entire region? They, they were super successful, right? No. They found that in each of those subpopulations, the dark mouse had evolved with a different genetic mutation. That to me is just outstanding to find out. You can reveal this to say that those black mice, they all came to the same solution. They were all facing the same restrictive environment, same climate, same predators above and below. The solutions that happened at random made all those black mice thrive and survive out on that scene. That thriving and surviving I keep talking about, this is the biggest idea of genetic selection, featuring restrictive environments that give benefit to those survivors. They pass on their materials. Now, what I didn't see him talk about in that video, and I you know, kind of like to, to know just kind of as a happenstance thing, those mice of the different subpopulations that turn black, can they breed and have successful offspring? Successful offspring breeding, that is a very big idea that I want you to really key on. Just because two animals of slightly different species can breed and make an offspring, does that make it a viable offspring? The answer is no. That is not the moniker that I want to hang on that one. What you got to be thinking about here is that to be a successful offspring, you have to be able to yourself then reproduce with another member of your same species and have another viable offspring. That's one that we're going to really trip on hard. You're going to find it over and over again. That's why I asked the question about two black mice separated by hundreds of miles, different subpopulations with different mutations that made their genome change. Okay, they're all black mice now but they didn't use the same mutations to get there. Different ways to find the strategy of success. This whole idea of the aggregate of species and the aggregate of populations, it's a subpopulation concept. I want you to be thinking about that in terms of how much variation there is and how much distribution of that subpopulation to the uh, neighboring populations. They're cohorts, but how about uh, the difference between Arizona and perhaps you get up to Washington? those black mice, because we have rock pocket mice here too, I wonder, are they the same population, same subpopulation? That's why we use the monikers of genus species. It's whether I'm talking about the mouse or tree, I can do the same things. Use that genus species and then see what I, I talked about earlier today about the Sarasi moose. That moose is a variety of Alsus alsus. Alsus alsus is that moose that we have all across North America and Northern Asia. Okay, it's the same moose? Well, not really, because the restrictive environments are different between the two continents. Even within our own continent, we have different subpopulations existing here. That's why we have Alsus alsus Shirasi. That's our variety here. We have different varieties. You can go to the uh, uh, virtual ecology page and go into some of the media, the resources. You'll see a whole page talking about the moose. You can see on that a distribution map of where they exist and what their different names are. Those are variations that are so discreet that you cannot get the breeding of one moose from this variety to another moose of the other variety and have a successful offspring. Okay, they can still breed, maybe. They can still produce an offspring, a baby. But can that baby grow and reproduce itself? That's where you have a break in the genetic selection criteria. When your babies can't pass on their genetic material because they're sterile. I talked about this uh, ponderosa pine and that secondary uh, cactus. Their adaptations are for their restrictive environments. We hit on that, we know it, and that whole restrictive environment and the adaptations you form, that's what I want you to see it right here. This is the environmental tolerance curve. This is in some of the writings for this week. Uh, one of the articles is a paper by Dr. Zamora. Uh, Dr. Ben Zamora, you all know that he, he was teaching this class before me, and he was my graduate professor when I was a student here. Okay, and that backs us up uh, quite a few years when he was on my master's committee. Uh, he wasn't on my doctoral one, but he was a, a great feature of this whole walk through ecology, especially here at WSU. But he's able to express this one fairly nicely, very nicely, as we talk about this idea of psychological optimum. Okay, that is where you're at the peak of your game. As a species within that restrictive environment, we start to push it out. You see the Gaussian bell-shaped curve? 
That was the idea. We're talking about modes of standard deviation. One deviation out on either side of the tails of the bell. You get out to the critical minimum and the critical maximum, you start to get the idea. That is where the species is at its range, its tolerance. It really can't exist a little further to the right or a little further to the left. It's like that ponderosa pine. It lives in the driest sites of this western interior shrublands and woodlands biome. But you get into the cacti areas way to the south, into Arizona, it's way out of its range. There's still an environmental range there, but this is below its critical minimum. It can't go there. That's its lower lethal limit has been exceeded. Know those terms, how they interact, and what you're going to see. That, that's just for one species. Knowing that your preferred range is right at the top of that bell-shaped curve. How about we stack a whole bunch of them together now? We're going to see on the left-hand side that A bar, maybe the ponderosa pine I'm talking about, B, B, uh, let's say Western Larch. Let's take a C up to Douglas fir. Okay, right there at Kamiak B, we've talked about those three and how they have an overlapping range. Within their optimums, the ponderosa pine, yeah, it can exist on that super dry site. It can exist where it's wetter, where it's not as warm. Ponderosa pine is pretty broad in that. You go over to C and you can tell right away, and B as well, actually, at Kamiak Butte, that it hit its lethal range before we got to the south-facing aspect for the western larch. It just can't get there from here. It needs a little bit more variation that it's more accustomed to. Okay, that's then you get over to the C column and you see the same. It is also sliding a little bit further to the right and it left its critical minimum. South-facing aspect, you see it clear. We're going to start to stack these different species up. And literally, folks, this can be for plants. We like to do it with plants because we, we get uh, photographic examples of it. But you could do that for animals as well. You could do it for fish, salmon, you name it. All of these different species have that bell-shaped curve, that Gaussian distribution. I want you to see how those landscapes will fit into some and not into others. Why you don't see any uh, Western hemlock or Western red cedar at Kamiak Butte. Can't get there from here. It's way too dry, way too hot, not enough moisture uh, massing in that substrate material. This whole idea of bringing these things together and knowing that you have organisms existing, competing within their environments, is to say that we can express this through a term of differential reproduction. Those are the organisms that are adapted to their environments how they can thrive here versus there. That's what I talked about a little bit ago. They got a lot of white-tailed deer right here in Pullman. We've even had a few Sarasi moose walking through town, right? We saw that up at Greek Row. We saw a bunch of folks getting frantic because this has never happened before. Well, yeah, it has. And we've had moose here for decades. They live here. This is their environment. We can start to ask the question now. I just showed you a video from 10 miles from here of the mule deer at Kamiak Butte. I got a herd of about 20 to 30 animals right there but I don't see him walking around Pullman. That's because the environment that exists here is not consistent with their genome, with how those animals su survive. They, they can get here, obviously. A 10-mile walk by a bunch of deer is not a problem, but they don't have a purpose for getting here. They don't want to show up. There, there's no purpose for it, so they just aren't going to come. What they're looking for is where they can be successful in their environment. That's where they want to fit. That's their niche, how they want to really make things happen for them to be successful at natural selection. You know, the mule deer, maybe they aren't as good at interacting with the humans as the white-tailed deer are, because we got a lot of those white tail just bouncing around everywhere. But again, I'm going back to this idea of how many of those traits are preferential versus heritable. Okay, that heritability is what you really got to key on when we talk about this whole realm of natural selection. And I'll show you graphs like this, showing the DNA and the chromosome chains and all that wonderful stuff. Knowing that that mutation, that random refiring, we're, we're not just making Xerox copies of us every day. We're making these replications through sexual reproduction. When you get that sexual reproduction, you then have the opportunity for that variation to be introduced. That mutation that just strikes in. And when you find it, if it's heritable, I've talked about this way too much now, you know that this can be passed along. It'll be there forever. Yeah, be able to hopefully uh, mix it all along and push it through one by one. It could be just like this dark moth and white moth, right? The heritability through natural selection is going to absolutely strike it hard. Now, I got to say that little black moth on the, uh, the photograph there, if he had just moved up uh, about two inches to the top and two inches to the right, maybe it would have blended in well then. It didn't quite have that heritability trait. Maybe some eyes could see in uh, the black and white colors. Wow, a lot of questions on that, but that white moth has totally got it made. 
Hey, we talk a lot about these environmental restrictions. I keep uh, tapping you up on these. The idea that the environment that they exist in is going to be the filter that says whether that genetic trait was positive or negative, or like I say, just neutral. All these competitions that you see between members of your own species and the neighboring species are going to define how beneficial those are. When they become beneficial, and you can pass along that genetic trait, then you've got an evolution process in effect. It's working, it's happening, and you're, you're pushing it all along. You can go through these graphs. I want you to read the, uh, uh, the works today by Dr. Zamora that are in the, the outline talk, talking all about this topic. It's the idea that those that are not beneficial are going to fall out of the gene pool. They don't get passed along because they got eliminated before they could sexually reproduce. That step along is going to see the favorability versus elimination. That is your competition within that environment. How are you going to process it? How are you going to operate it within every species? It's going to be different. It's going to take different times, depending on what that environment dictates. That's why I want you to really get this key that this whole idea of genetic mutations, natural selection, it's a process that can take, like I say, years and years or happen fairly quick you're going to know that this is going to be the definition of your species. You're going to look at those four things on this list to find out what those variations are. This is how you're going to define when natural selection can happen, when it's beneficial, really how it tracks out. Well, I'm going to take this as through a better example. Now, like I said, I was at the view. This is on the north-facing aspect of one of our game camera stations. Uh, near the fixed plot, actually, where we do the, uh, the tree data, uh, the field trip where we uh, do the tree sampling information, this is right beside that plot. I've got the game camera. It's actually in the same exact spot, these two different deer. On the left-hand side, you see a mule deer. Okay, I got the white rump, a little uh, black tip at the end. And then on the right-hand side, I see the white-tailed deer. That is the brown tail going all the way down. And the little confusion there is, if you're not familiar with it, is when that white-tailed deer or any deer gets spooked, their tails go up. Kind of like the skunk, right? Well, the underside of that tail is all white. That is the flag to every one of the members of the species to say, hey, danger ahead, wave that tail in the air. And that's why they're called the white tail. These are two separate species. We were going to talk about orders of speciation. Uh, the first order being where you get a variety named like that moose, the Sarasi moose. That's the first order of species variation. Also, also Sarasi. Now here, Otocolius hemionis is the mule deer on the left. Otocolius virginianus on the right. They have gone through the second stage of speciation to become separate species totally. They're no longer the same species like that alsus alsus for the moose. Well, we're going to step in to a, a little local area here. We're not too far away in Yakima, but uh, let's take a listen to what he is talking about for a hybrid species between whitetail and mule deer. My name is Bob Nicholson. I'm at the Yakima River in eastern Washington. I've been setting out trail cameras and I've seen mule deer and white-tailed deer, but I've also seen some deer that I think are hybrids. The first video clips I'm going to show you are ones that I think are just normal mule deer. There's a lot of variation in the deer, white-tailed versus mule deer, that hunters especially will recognize as the antlers on the males. I'm going to give you a really great uh, feedback story on that as how that cannot be your selection criteria of any reliability. Uh, I'll let Bob go back to this in just a moment. He's going to tell us more. These are all the mule deer that he has seen. The next deer I'm going to show you are the ones I think are just regular white tails. There's a white tail flagging in the air and why they got their name. But when it's down, it's just like that brown hair, more matched with its uh, hide. Okay, now coming up next are the hybrids I've been telling you about, at least the deer I think might be hybrids. Notice their tails have characteristics that are kind of like white tails and also characteristics that are kind of like mule deer, kind of intermediate between the two.
So he thinks these may be hybrids. And the very first I've seen, you may have seen uh, antlers on one of them. And we're going to come back to talk about that one too. Why that may be a misnomer for everybody to think on. But look at those rumps. That's you know, where we look to see the, the white tail, uh, white ring uh, bowl uh, versus that tail with the brown on it. Now you got to ask yourself, what, what do those look more like? And why is there that kind of variation? Right there, you see some antlers on that buck. And he's saying that may be a, a hybrid right there. That's got to be it, right? Well, I'm going to take you through this one to say that with this, uh, this whole discussion about the hybrid species, it's been going on for years and years. The idea that there are hybrids out there. And I will say that as I, I'm a hunter as well, and uh, years ago, when I was hunting near Almoda, which is only about uh, 10 miles south of here, and, and there I saw what I think were hybrid uh, whitetail mule deer crossbreeds. And where I saw them was the fawns. It was in a period of time late in the, the summer, uh, coming into the fall. And as the doe, the mama, uh, saw the, the people, or me and uh, my son, uh, we, we started running up the hill. It ran like a whitetail because she was a whitetail. But the babies, they, they were just having a hard time. They tried to spook like mama, in one sense, tried to run like a whitetail, and the other hop like a mule deer. Now, the mule deer, they're forking, they, they bunk, 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 but uh, when the mule deer fawns tried that, they were crashing to the ground. They just failed miserably. They couldn't flee to save their lives. Man, we weren't hunting them, we were looking at them and watching these different animals move around. So Boone and Crockett had taken on the challenge to say, we're going to, you know, Boone and Crockett, you know, as a hunting cooperative uh, kind of an organization, but they did some research on this, and one of the research mecca was right here in Pullman at Stephen Center. There used to be whitetail and mule deer in uh, big pins over there. Uh, Dr. Bruce Davitt uh, was the one who had ran that operation. I had the fortunate opportunity to work for him at Stephen Center with these deer. I loved it, but what they found out was a lot about the idea behind the interbreeding of the species, making that fertile offspring. That idea is what was proven here and what really tracks it out well. That discussion being that mule deer and white-tailed deer breed, and it happens in the environment. I just told you about the, the offspring I saw. Male offspring, and this was the Boone and Crockett research had uh, pulled it out and cited their sources. The male offspring die in vitro. They just can't make it. They don't make it to birth. And for the rare occasion, like one in a million that does make it to birth, it's sterile and it generally dies within the first year. It just can't live in the restrictive environment of anything because the genetic make makeup is all mixed. Hey, you all know the stories about like the liger, like uh, there's a mix between a tiger and a lion. All those babies are sterile. And that's what they found for the white-tail mule deer crossbeeds where the does were actually born. They lived, like the babies I told you about, they're sterile. They cannot reproduce. Now again, it goes back to a, a thing of numbers. You may be talking about one in a hundred thousand of those does could reproduce, but None of the boys can reproduce with her of her same genetic makeup. Only then it would be a white-tailed deer buck or a mule deer buck breeding with that, now not a fawn anymore, but now a, a fertile doe. That offspring would then be 75% one of the species and 25% the other. I have no idea what their sterility or fertility ratios are. But that is the definition of a species, folks. You can't tell me that a white-tailed deer, mule deer crossbreed uh, has any viability. Anyone who shows you uh, that that has happened on the antler uh, picture, you just got to ask that question now. I've got mule deer on the left and white tailed deer on the right. They're at the exact same site. They're species that are commingling in the exact same restrictive environment. They're not crossbreeds at all, and I don't expect us to see any here. Two different species, do they look alike? Well, they're similar. They're both the same size. They are absolutely in the same restrictive environment. I do not expect them to ever be able to successfully breed. And that's the word I'm going to keep you on. Successfully breed with fertile offspring that they make. That's the one that uh, if you want to get into more research on it, I would say go on and do it. There's a lot of open opportunity there. They're already at the second stage of speciation. They're more distantly related than the moose that we have right here in Pullman and Kamiak Butte are from the ones in Alaska. Okay, those are closer relations than these two species right here. 